So, hello, my name is Nicholas Matsakis, and I am the co-lead of the language design team along with Josh Triplett. I'm also a member of the Rust compiler team, I'm working on Rust for, for a little while. I started at Mozilla Research, but I recently joined AWS in January of this year, and I'm going to be telling you about where I think Rust is and where I think we should be going. So let's get started. So 2021 was quite a year. Uh, we went from uh, last year, a project that was primarily supported by one company, Mozilla, to a project that has its own foundation with, you know, a current count, six platinum sponsors, including many of the biggest names in computing. So it's not bad. But if that's not enough, many of those companies have formed teams employing people to work on Rust the language. Right, uh, pretty cool. So we've got a lot more people being paid to work on Rust this year than ever before, and uh, including myself, I'm one of those teams. And if that is not enough to convince you that 2021 is some kind of landmark year for Rust, what about this? Rust is under consideration for inclusion in the Linux kernel. So that's pretty cool. I mean, given all of that, I have to ask you, is this it? Did we like make it? Is that what happened here? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. I think to answer it, we have to go back a little bit and say, what was the er goal? You know, what was the purpose of Rust when we started out? Um, it wasn't just to get in the Linux kernel, although I'm not sure I thought that would ever happen, but it was something different. It was to take the power of C and C++ Right? and put it in a package that has that great feeling of JavaScript, and Ruby, and Python, the easy to use feeling, and, and get the best of both worlds. You know, have our cake and eat it too, I used to say all the time. Uh, and you can kind of put that in this like graph form, right? That's, I see these kind of graphs a lot, I think they're, they're good. So you got C++ on the, on the one side, really strong performance, but not always so easy to use. And then you've got on the other side, JavaScript, and Ruby and Python, which are really easy to use, can ramp up really quickly and get people started. And there's lots of, uh, of, of people who you can hire to work on your project. But the performance, while sometimes great, uh, other times, especially in like critical code tests, isn't what you need. Right? So the premise of Rust is kind of bam, there we are. Top right corner, all the performance, all the ease of use, all the power, all the time. And when things are going well, you know, there are times I think we actually do achieve that, which is really cool. So recently saw a blog post that I think is a good example of this. It comes from Tenable. Um, there's a link down there. And you see that they had a, a logging service and they rewrote it from JavaScript into Rust. Saw a 95% reduction in memory usage, 75% reduction in CPU usage. And maybe you're not so surprised because you're thinking, well, okay, sure, if you rewrite JavaScript into a language like C++ or Rust, it's going to get faster. But, you know, not only that, they did it all in a single sprint in two weeks. That's pretty cool. And it works, right? Um, so that's kind of what we're going for, that you should be able to get this high performance thing, stuff that was always possible, but took a lot of engineering and maintenance effort and do it with the same skill set that you use to develop JavaScript and so forth. Right? So well, that is what we're going for. Um, this is kind of how it should feel, right? I think we, there's some sentences that come to mind when I think about Rust. Like, we want it to be performant. Now you often hear people kind of say, wow, I wrote this Rust program and it ran really fast, right out of the box. Um, well, at least if they remember to use cargo run release, they say that. Other times they might complain and then find out that indeed it does run fast. Um, or they might say, that after they've been working in Rust for a while, they've kind of found this curious thing that they've noticed that once they get, it took a while sometimes to get things to compile, but once they do, they tend to work. You know, and if there is a bug, of course there are bugs, but they're not usually a result of like surprising Rust semantics, but more like somewhere in your logic, uh, you, you made an error. And what that means in practical terms is you can take a big program, do a kind of ambitious refactoring, get it to compile and then find that it works the first time. 
or you could take some loop and run it in parallel and be confident that the compiler is going to detect any places where you might be using the same data from two threads in compatible ways. And so your code just works, right? And what all that adds up to, the performant, the reliable, is that Rust is really meant to be empowering, right? We're trying to take complex things that used to be hard to do and make them easy to do. And so you can still do them. Um, and, you know, we want to make kind of wizardry stuff possible. Like, you want to use that nifty kernel API that everyone's talking about? You can do it in Rust and you won't have to deal with 100 seg bulbs because it's wrapped up in a nice, safe interface. Do you want to run code on an embedded device with no operating system? Go for it. You've got a whole bunch of uh, people in the embedded working group developing all kinds of cool abstractions to make that easy for you to do. Right? That's what Rust is all about. But it's not always like that, right? Uh, if, if what we're going for is the ease of use of JavaScript, the performance of C++, we're not quite there. We're maybe more like here. You know, we've got the great performance. I think that we, we nail with hands down. Uh, and sometimes things are really easy, right? You're on the right path, like in that tenable blog post. But using Rust, especially early on, still means spending a lot of time fighting the borrow checker and learning the tricks of the trade, kind of how to work around what that error message means. And how error messages can be really great, but sometimes they're really confusing. Or uh, what the right solution is to that particular situation. And I think you just can't claim that on the whole, Rust is as easy to use as JavaScript, or Ruby, or Python. It's just not true. And you can see that in the data. And so here's some results. These are survey results from 2019. Uh, I don't have ready access to a chart from 2020, the most recent survey, but I'm sure the results are comparable. And so we asked people how long it took until they felt productive using Rust, which is kind of related to ease of use, right? How long till they felt productive? And you can see in this chart that there's a good chunk of people who get productive pretty quickly. This is sort of the tenable case. Less than a month. That's great. Um, and that the only reason that's even possible trust me, is all the hard work that we've put into the design of the language, of course, but also all the stuff around it, the error messages, the documentation, cargo, um, the crates. Like without all that work, this number would be a lot, a lot smaller, the number of people who, who get productive this quickly. Unfortunately, you can see that for a lot of people, getting productive in Rust is measured not in weeks, but in months. Um, and there's a pretty decent chunk of people over here on the left that say they've never felt productive at all. Now, when I read that, I thought, well, I bet they're all beginners, right? I bet they're just using Rust for, for a week or two. Ooh, wrong. That's not quite right. So when I thought that, we cross-referenced the data with, well, how long have those people uh, who don't feel productive been using Rust? And you can see that it's all over the map, right? Some of them, they've only been using it a few months. So yeah, they're kind of beginners. That's, that's the largest term. But for some people, they've been using Rust more than, th more than three years and still don't feel productive. Right? Now, it's difficult to interpret survey data. That might not be the language. That might not mean they don't know how to use Rust. They might just mean like the libraries they need are not there or the IDE tooling isn't up to what they expect. That's what one person told me. Uh, and that might be true. But at the same time, I think these, these numbers give pause, right, room for concern. If we want people to feel as productive in Rust as they do in, in Python, and I do, we've got to do better. The fact is, Rust really racks well, once you learn it. But getting that done can be pretty difficult. So I recently heard this best phrase ever. <laughs> which describes the situation. Rust is the language where you get the hangover first. It's perfect on so many levels. I mean, first, the obvious one. Getting used to Rust, it takes time, right? And once you're past that hangover that you get up front, then you get kind of the drinking period that normally comes first, you get that then. Like you have a new pair of wings, right? You can build and maintain ambitious projects. And you start using it not just for ambitious ones. I hear a lot of people saying, uh, at first, I used Rust to write this you know, powerful thing I'm doing at work, but then I had this old script that I wrote, and I needed to modify it, and it was kind of annoying, and I wanted a library, so I decided to just rewrite it in Rust. Then I could use Cargo, 
The code's about the same length, but now it runs faster than it did before, and I'm able to come back and modify it again and again without having to be afraid. So this is exactly why that metaphor is awesome, because it goes the other way, right? Uh, many other languages or, uh, you yeah, know, in practice, what often happens, right, is it feels really great at first. You're writing a lot of code, the code's running really easily, but then the hangover comes and you realize that there's these subtle bugs that don't show up until after it's in production or you have to go back and, and rework it and you can't find all the places you have to make a change. So all things considered, I'd rather have the hangover first. I'd just like to see what we can do to make it a lot shorter or maybe have no hangover at all. That would be even better. So I think this whole setup, you know, is exactly why Rust keeps winning that most loved question on Stack Overflow is because what that question asks is, if you're using Rust, do you want to keep using it? And people who are using Rust, once they've, they've kind of gotten past that hangover and they're into it, they're in that sweet period that comes later. So they do want to keep using Rust. But, you know, that's a really cool number we love to cite, but if you look at the most popular one, what languages are used the most, Rust doesn't do nearly as well. Now, granted, we come into 5% of respondents, number 19, which is way better than I ever thought we were going to do when we started working on this project, right? But still, I think Rust deserves to be a lot higher in that list. I think there's a whole lot of projects that would benefit the people with, from, from being written in Rust. They would go faster, they would use less resources, uh, and they'd be easier to maintain, and people would like it, but they're not doing that today. Yeah. So that comes back to my question. Are we there yet? No, we're not there yet. But we have come a long way, right? 2015, that's when we did our 1.0 release. That was basically the, hey, we showed Rust can work. What had seemed like a pie in the sky research effort was being used to ship production systems. That was really cool. Now, 2021, we're showing Rust adoption has grown to the point where it is used in many critical systems that underlie the internet uh, and in, in all kinds of places that you are almost certainly using today, right? And we're seeing more and more Rust developers getting hired to work on the project. I think we can expect that trend to continue. So we're getting out of this trap of uh, kind of relatively few developers working on it, which, which I think is gonna be great and it's gonna lead to more and more development and help us grow faster and sustainably. But if the next goal you know, is to achieve the widespread usage that I said I think Rust deserves, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and I think there's space for us to grow and there's a lot of places where we'd be a good fit if people could just learn it. So how do we get there? How do we get Rust into widespread usage? Well, we do the Rust Evangelism strike force because that works great. Mm, no, I think, you know, going out and hectoring people into using Rust isn't probably going to do the trick. Um, I think we need a different approach. So what about this? What if we said a goal for ourselves? Instead of taking six months, which is a common number right here, for people to feel productive in Rust, what if we could make it so that they felt productive in six weeks or even less? You know? Yeah. That would be pretty cool, right? I mean, it, it's, I'm not sure how we're going to do it, but it would be pretty cool. Well, I think it would be more than that. Uh, I think it would be transformative, and I think we can do it, but we have to really up our game, right? We have to approach it very deliberately, and there's going to be a couple of things we have to do. So one of them, the two that I listed here to start, is we're going to have to be focused, and we're going to have to be really creative. So when I say focused, what I mean is we've got to keep our eye on the ball, on the goal of making Rust easier to use, shorter time to productivity, without sacrificing all the things that make Rust great, right? If we just end up turning Rust into another language, that, that no, nobody wins. So I think the way we should approach this is we need to identify the ways that we want Rust to feel. I've given three here. There are some, I think there are more we can, we can say, but we want Rust, for example, to be reliable. We want that if it compiles, it works. We want it to be performant. We want it to be empowering. And if we keep our eye on those goals, and when we're working on a design, we, we sort of make sure that 
it feels all those ways, then I think we're going to find we're doing better. And if we're, it's not, that's where the creativity part comes in, right? Um, we're trying to get a delicate balance of exposing a lot of complexity in a really simple way. And it's really hard and we have to think hard and we have to try a lot of different approaches before we actually are able to do it. Um, so, you know, we need to both be focused on what we need to do and be creative in the ways we go about doing it. Okay, so what else? Well, we need to think broadly, by which I mean we have to look at the experience of using Rust holistically. Look at all the things users are trying to do and figure out how to make sure that all the pieces they need to do those things are there, even though a lot of those things aren't going to be under our direct control, and not the language proper or the standard library, right? So actually, we can give a good example if we go back to that blog post I started out with, the one from Tenable, where they reduce their resource usage. If you look at their blog, you're going to find that before that post came another post, one where they were evaluating Rust and deciding whether to use it. It's a nice read. It's called Building a Microservice with Rust. And one of the things that I liked about it was they went through what are all the pieces of the puzzle they need to build a typical microservice? Right, so here they have a clear goal. They're going to build this service, and they need an HTTP API, code to work with the database, code to read messages from the queue, a Docker file, and so on. Right, and you can see how they found most of those pieces, and some of them they had to kind of cobble together with some scripts and other stuff. And that gives you a clue. Well, maybe that's a missing piece. Right? That's something that if you didn't know what to do, you might get stuck. Uh, and if we want to push productivity down to a few weeks, we need to make sure that all those pieces actually are there and are documented. And that includes like kind of glue code like or libraries like I just talked about, but also things like documentation, IDE integration, and debugging support. So learning ownership and borrowing, you know, that's always going to take some time, but the rest of that stuff we can definitely solve. Um, and we should do so. All right, so we're going to think broadly. Now, what else are we going to do? Well, we need to be bold. We've got to be willing to take some risks. So if you want new results, and I do, you've got to do new things, right? Here's a list of things we've never done, mostly for good reasons, I will say. Uh, and I think, though, we're going to have to revisit and take a careful look at our hard lines and our fixed assumptions of things that we know are a bad idea and try to try to reevaluate them in terms of those experiences. Are we really, is it, is it really preserving the experience to have this fixed rule or can we change the rule in a way that makes some other parts of the experience we want better without say, hurting the performant part of the experience or the reliable part. Um, and I don't know if these specific things, these specific questions are the right ones, right? I can't tell you exactly which uh, assumptions we have to reevaluate, but I can tell you for sure that if we want to get the goal of being productive in six weeks. Um, if we want to make Rust a kind of widespread mainstream language, and I do, we have to be willing to re-examine those basic assumptions and make sure that they still hold. So on the topic of revisiting, re-examining basic assumptions, let me turn a little bit and talk about the Rust 2021 edition. You may have heard we have one this year. Woohoo! Yes. Uh, and editions are really cool because they give us this awesome tool that lets us remake decisions that we made and tweak them if we think we might like to do it differently without breaking all the code that already exists. So how does that work? The idea of an addition is simple. Every crate declares what Rust edition it's going to use. So Rust 2015, that's kind of the 1.0 release, Rust 2018, and soon to be Rust 2021. And no matter which edition you're using, your crate interoperates with all the other editions and all the other crates, right? Editions are an internal implementation decision. They don't affect your ABI or your, no, they don't affect your ABI. They also don't affect your API, right? Um, and even better, uh, if you'd like to upgrade from an older crate, older edition to a newer one, we have tooling that will do it automatically for you, right? So this is not a split the ecosystem situation. This is just get access to newer and better Rust. Uh, and what we use additions for is to make targeted improvements that make Rust easier to use. And it's often the kind of stuff that you probably wouldn't even realize it changed. It's just that there were corner cases that made it impossible for us to, uh, to improve Rust in a way we wanted to unless we were willing to tweak the rules. So 
So here's an example of something like that. Today in Rust, when you have closures, they always capture an entire local variable. So these two closures here, um, they will both capture the tuple variable, which means that they're going to get in an error because you can't have two owners of the same variable at one time. But in 20, 2021, this code actually works. And that's because the compiler observes that they're accessing different fields of the tuple. And so it'll give tuple.0 over to this first closure and tuple.1 over to the second closure, right? And now that's great. And once I saw this pattern, I started to realize how often, you know, it comes up that I'm doing little workarounds for this limitation. And now those little workarounds won't be necessary. Um, but making this change did require us to use an addition because it can affect when destructors run, when memory gets free, other subtle things. Uh, so I want to just give a big shout out to the RSC 229 project group for their hard work on this. They were really persistent and they saw it through and it's going to be awesome. Now here's another example. This is not a subtle change that you'd never notice, but it's a pretty cool feature that uh, doesn't really break much stuff and mostly just works, except for the occasional corner case which is that we used to allow, or we now, we used to require you to put variables outside of the placeholder like this when printing, and soon, not yet, but we will allow you to just put them in line. This is actually going to work on all the additions. The problem that we had to use an addition for is that when, in certain cases of like panicking, uh, accepted, strain, cer certain rather dubious things <laughs> used to be accepted in work around panicking, and we had to, to change those semantics a little, um, and additions let us do that. So that's really great. And shout out to Mara for making that happen. It was an epic effort. And I don't have time to go through all this stuff in the edition, but let me just call out a bunch of people who contributed. Um, you all are fantastic. And thank you so much. Edition's going to be awesome. So, all right. We're ready to be focused, creative, bold. What do we do? <laughs> It happens that this very question was facing us earlier this year, earlier this year, as we thought about how to approach async rest. So you may recall that in 2019, we shipped the async await MVP in rest. This was a huge achievement. The design was really cool. Um, and the implementation had gotten done and we were ready. It had taken many years, but we were ready to, to see it come into practice. And in the time since, I think we've been validated for all the effort we put into it. There's a, more and more uses of async rest. And we've had a lot of time to gain a, quite a lot of experience. And we now, you know, it's time to look past that MVP and see what do we really want async Rust to be? What are the, what is the, how can we make async Rust, you know, reliable, efficient, performant? Um, what does the full feature look like? And the problem is there's such a huge range of possibilities, right? And so many variations to explore many ways it could be. So how do we get everybody on the same page with what it should be? So I raised this question with Shane Miller, who works on the AWS Rust team, and she shared with me some of the approaches she had used to do similar drives within Amazon and elsewhere in the past. And I thought it was pretty cool. So the idea was, basically you start out with an in-depth examination of the status quo. What's it like to use async Rust today? Uh, and get detailed, and you find out what problems people want to solve today, what problems they are solving, and the challenges that they face in doing so. And these challenges are often not in the area as you think. It's a really simple example. When I discuss async rest with working programmers, oftentimes the first thing that they talk about is what IDE should I use? Or how well does the debugger work or not work? Right? How much raw assembly do I have to deal with when I'm debugging? That stuff is totally independent from async rest but it's still a blocker to adoption, right? It's what stops them from feeling productive. So it's totally relevant. Anyway, once you get a good handle on the status quo, you start to think about the shiny future. The idea is to go back through those status quo stories of what people were trying to do and what problems they hint and reimagine how could it be, right? And that brings you to, first you start out with what you want it to be like and you go backward and think, what are the steps if I had, a feature that did something like this, I could have that happen. How could I get a feature that goes somewhere like that? Let me go backwards further um, until you have a path, right? Maybe a shaky and unreliable path, but a path that's gonna take you into a really awesome experience. So we did this for async Rust, and uh, we 
just, we were trying to figure out how can we approach this in an open source way, right? So Tyler Mandry and I led the ASIC Foundation's working group, and what we did was we we did this collaborative uh, effort. Uh, so it wasn't just it just one person drafting it, but rather we went out and we consulted. Oh, sorry, keep my slide there. We consulted the community, sort of, uh, pretty broadly for ideas about the status quo, about the shiny future. I mean, we ran sessions where we had people come in and uh, like join us at, with a HackMD, a shared HackMD, and we would write stories together that worked in all the experiences of the people in the call. Sometimes we went and talked to companies uh, or in private conversations to get a feeling for how they were using it, the things that they made uh, you know, in building their own software. So, and out of all that, we kind of uh, developed this picture of what the shiny future and the status quo look like, right? And I wanna talk to you a little bit about that. Um, so we, we started out with some of the basic experiences right, in terms of thinking about the shiny future of how async Rust should feel in a year or two. And one thing is it should be consistent. Right? You should be able to basically, if you know synchronous Rust, learning async Rust should be as simple as adding some async awaits and taking advantage of a bunch of new capabilities. Um, the smaller we can keep the gap between them, the easier it'll be to move from one to the other. Now, in practice, what we found is that's not always true. So we've, there has been a lot of effort to keep them analogous, but some things are more different than it seems like they should be. So to take, for example, this is, this is an iterator trait. This is not async, it's standard Rust, synchronous Rust. It requests the next item and um, takes ownership of it. And if you look at the async version that's currently in Nightly, you see it looks pretty different. It's got a different name, it's called stream, uh, and its method doesn't, isn't called next, it's called poll next, and it uses this thing called a pin, and what it does is, it basically asks, is the next item ready? And if so, gets it, and otherwise says, no, it's not ready, right? Which is the underlying mechanism that you use to implement futures. So it's kind of exposing this, this abstraction up. If you want to implement this trait, you have to understand futures all the way down. Um, now, what we'd like to get to, and what we think we will get to, is this async iterator trait, which looks pretty much exactly like the synchronous iterator trait, except it has the keyword async, right? Well, that fulfills our experience that we're looking for. And getting there is gonna require implementing a bunch of interesting stuff, uh, a bunch of which is already underway and has long been desired, like type LAs, integer, generic associated types. But the end result is gonna be this really simple experience, which is great. Um, and here's another example. This one has to do with looking beyond the boundaries of the language uh, at all the things that people need for the full life cycle of what they're trying to do. So one thing we found when talking to people using async REST is that there's a real gap in tooling that emerges when you shift from synchronous to asynchronous REST. With synchronous REST, most of the things you're doing, like processes and threads, and they're well understood to the operating system. So you can use kind of C-based tooling, which has its flaws, but uh, you know things like perf and so on, to analyze performance, and it works pretty well. But with async REST, the user space scheduler has a whole lot of concepts like tasks and channels that aren't understood by the runtime and it's really hard to visualize them. Um, and that makes it hard to debug problems. It also makes it hard to do things like gain, get live uh, metrics of your services that are in production, which a lot of people like to do. So fortunately, there's a lot of effort within the ecosystem itself to address this need, right? So Tokyo, for example, Eliza Wiseman is building this really cool thing called Tokyo Console. It's kind of giving you a top-like view of all your asynchronous tasks. Um, and it's going to get extended in various ways. There's all kinds of plans to detect and warn about common pitfalls and, and uh, replay uh, events and so on. And so I think you know, seeing developments like this is going to work to make the using async Rust from start to finish a productive, enjoyable experience. And another interesting thing about it, um, well, I'll get to that interesting thing in a second. So there's some more things in the vision doc that I don't have time to go into. You should definitely check it out if you'd like to read it. So we've got, for example, APIs to go across runtimes and spawning tasks and so on. It's going to be a pretty cool feature. So that, that other thing I wanted to mention, it's kind of a general point. Whenever I talk about making Rust easier to use, I think a kind of warning flag goes off in, in people's minds that they think that this is gonna come at the expense of the power and flexibility that they came to Rust for. 
And I think, as I said earlier, if we succeed in this goal by turning Rust into a different language that it no longer achieves the goals it set out to do, the great power of C++, if we fail, you know, then we haven't hit that upper right corner that we're shooting for. And, um, but what I found in practice is that this tension between easy to use and, and exposing power, it's very real, but it's also very surmountable. And when you do it, you get a kind of better for everyone feeling. Um, and work on, that goes to benefit one group usually winds up benefiting all the groups if you do it right. But the console project is actually an interesting example of this because it started out as an effort to help people who already had services kind of going into production or who were debugging their really complex async rest. So they already know async rest and they need help debugging it, right? It's like a late stage feature. But what we found when we, uh, well, I didn't do these demos, I didn't say we, but what I've heard from people who were doing demos um, is that just seeing the set of, of tasks help people to understand the model better. So it becomes also a teaching tool, right? It was targeting late stage, but it's useful for early stage. And definitely, I think anyone who enjoys the ease of use that Rust already offers knows that focusing on early stage also benefits late stage. All right. Uh, I would also point out, I guess, just that working on async itself benefits synchronous, right? It's another example. It's, a, it's not about early and late, but about working on one area of Rust often requires fundamental work that improves and extends all of Rust. So what's next? Um, I think if we can achieve these goals, and we will, what we're going to do is find that we aren't just making systems programming accessible to more people, which is what we've often talked about, but we're even changing kind of what systems programming is, in a sense, or what systems programming languages are used for, at least. Right? So instead of being the go-to language for critical systems, Rust is going to be the go-to language for anything running in the cloud, embedded devices, and all kinds of things, things where reliability counts. Right? And if we do that, what would that be like? It'd be pretty great. Well, we've always found you know, we're going to have more people. That's going to bring us more good ideas, because people have good ideas. Having more good ideas is going to make Rust better, which is going to lead to more people, which is going to be a nice little virtuous cycle. Right? If we can get on that train, we're going to find Rust accelerating and improving faster and more than ever before. So thank you so much. Uh, this is the end of my talk. As I said, I'm really excited about what's coming up for Rust in the next few years. I hope I've gotten you excited, and I hope you enjoy the rest of RustConf. All right. Ciao.